so terrible a punishment. Something awful. She married a mortal. <gasps> Is it injudicious to marry a mortal? Injudicious? It strikes at the root of the whole fairy system. By our laws, the fairy who marries a mortal dies. <gasps> but Iolanthe didn't die. No! <laughs> Because your queen, who loved her with a surpassing love, commuted her sentence to penal servitude for life, on condition that she leave her husband without a word of explanation and never communicate with him again. And that sentence of penal servitude she is now living out, on her head, at the bottom of that stream. <laughs> yes, but when I banished Iolanthe... <laughs> I gave her all the pleasant places of the earth to choose from. I'll never understand why she decided to go and live at the bottom of a stream. Ugh, think of the damp. Oh, and her chest was always delicate. Ugh, and the frogs. I shall never enjoy peace of mind until I understand why Iolanthe went to go and live among the frogs. Why not you summon her and ask her? Why? Why? <laughs> because if I were to set eyes on Iolanthe, I should forgive her at once. Then why not forgive her? Twenty-five years. It's a long time. Think how we loved her. <laughs> <laughs> Loved her? Why, what was your love to mine? Iolanthe was invaluable to me. Why, who taught me how to curl myself inside of a buttercup? Iolanthe. Who taught me how to swing upon a cobweb? Iolanthe. Who taught me how to nestle myself into a nutshell, dive into a dewdrop, and gamble upon a gossamer? I 
Philanthi. <laughs> she certainly did surprising things. <laughs> oh, give her back to us, great queen, for your sake, if not for ours. Please, 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 please. Oh, I should be strong, but I am weak. I should be marble, but I am clay. Her punishment has been heavier than I intended. Very well. It shall be as you wish. It shall be as you wish. I will learn thee from thy dark exile. Thou art so. Pretty? He's extremely pretty. <laughs> but he's inclined to be 
be stout. Oh. I, see, I see no objection to stoutness in moderation. <laughs> and what is he? He's an Arcadian shepherd, and he loves Phyllis, a ward in chancery. A mere shepherd? And he half a fairy? He's a fairy, down to the waist. But his legs are mortal. <laughs> Dear me. I have no reason to think that I am more curious than any other person. However, I do admit, I would like to see this person who is a fairy to the waist, but whose legs are mortal. <laughs> Nothing easier, for here he comes. <laughs> Good morrow, good mother, good mother, good morrow. By some means or other, pray banish your sorrow. With joy beyond telling, my bosom is swelling, so joy in a measure express of a pleasure. For I'm to be married today, today, yes, I'm to be married today. Yes, he's to be married today. Not he indeed. And to all my tearful prayers, he answers, A shepherd lad is no fit helpmate for a ward of chancery. I stood in court, and there I played him songs of Arcady with flute accompaniment. In vain. At first he seemed amused, as did the bar, but quickly wearing of my song and pipe, he bade me get out. A servile usher, then in crumpled bands and rusty bombazine, led me, still singing, into chancery lane. No, oh, I'll go no more. I'll marry her today and face the upshot, be what it may. But who are these? <laughs> oh, Strephon, rejoice with me, for my queen has pardoned me. Pardoned you, mother? This is good news indeed. And these ladies are my beloved sisters. <laughs> Your sisters? Then they are my aunts. <laughs> A cheery piece of news for your bride on her wedding day. Shh, shh, shh. My bride knows nothing of my fairyhood. I dare not tell her, lest it frighten her. She think me mortal and prefers me so. Your fairyhood doesn't seem to have done you much good. Much good? My beloved aunt, tis the curse of my very existence. What use is it being half a fairy? My body can creep through a keyhole, but... What's the good in that if my legs remain kicking behind? <laughs> I can make myself invisible, down to the waist. But what's the use of that when my legs remain exposed to view? <laughs> my brain is a fairy brain. But from the waist downward, I'm a dittering idiot. <laughs> my upper half is immortal, but... My lower half grows older every day, and someday must die of old age. What's to happen to my upper half when my lower half is buried? I really don't know. I see your difficulty. But with a fairy brain, you should seek an intellectual sphere of action. Let's see. I have a borough or two at my disposal. How would you like to go into Parliament? A fairy member? Oh, how delightful! I'm afraid I should do no good there. For you see, from the waist upward, I'm a Tory of the most determined description. But my legs are a couple of confounded radicals, and on a division, they'd be sure to take me into the wrong lobby. <laughs> for you see, they are two to one, which is a strong working majority. <laughs> do not distress. For you shall be returned as a liberal conservative. <laughs> and your legs shall be our peculiar care. I see your majesty does not do things by halves. No, we are fairies to the feet. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
to be married today, today. Yes, we're to be married today. Yes, we're to be married today, today. Yes, we're to be married today. And today we're to be made happy forever. Well, we're to be married. <laughs> it's the same thing. I suppose it is. Oh, but Strephon, I tremble at the step I'm taking. I believe it's penal servitude for life to marry a ward of the court without the Lord Chancellor's consent. I shall be of age in two years. Don't you think you could wait two years? Two years? Have you ever looked in the glass? No, never. Here. Look at that. <laughs> and tell me if you think it's rational to expect me to wait for two years. No, you're quite right. <laughs> it's asking too much. One must be reasonable. Besides, <laughs> Who knows what could happen in two years? <laughs> Why, you might fall in love with the Lord Chancellor himself by that time. <laughs> yes, he's certainly a clean old gentleman. As it is, half the House of Lords are sighing at your feet. The House of Lords are certainly extremely attentive. Attentive? I should think they were. Why did five and twenty conservative peers come down to shoot over your grass plot last autumn? It couldn't have been the sparrows. Why did five and twenty liberal peers come down to fish in your pond? Don't tell me it was the goldfish. No, no. Delays are dangerous. If we are to marry, the sooner the better.
shines by the
affected your lordships, that you have appealed to me in a body to give her to whichever one of you she may think proper to select. And a noble lord has gone, <coughs> is going, to her cottage to request her immediate attendance. It would be idle to deny that I myself have the misfortune to be singularly attracted by this young person. My regard for her is rapidly undermining my constitution. Three months ago, I was a stout man. I need say, no more. 
If I could reconcile it with my duty, I should unhesitatingly award her to myself. For I can conscientiously say that I know no man who is so well fitted to render her exceptionally happy. Yeah. 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 But such an award would be open to misconstruction, and therefore, to whatever personal inconvenience, I waive my claim. Here we go! My lord, I wish, on part of this house, to express its sincere sympathy with your lordship's most painful position. <clears throat> I thank your lordships. The feelings of our lord chancellor, who's in love with the ward of court, are not to be envied. What is his position? Can he give his own consent to his own marriage with his own ward? Can he marry his own ward without his own consent? And if he marries his own ward without his own consent, can he hold himself for contempt of his own court? And if he holds himself for contempt of his own court, can he appeal by counsel before himself to move for arrest of his own judgment? Uh, my lord, it is indeed painful to have to sit upon a wool sack which is stuffed with such thorns as these. My lords, I have much pleasure in announcing that I have succeeded in inducing the hung person to present herself before the bar of this house.
this treasure <laughs> against the world I claim my darling's hand <laughs> a shepherd I a shepherd he a barca die a barca die are we
I know no courts of chancery. I go by nature's acts of parliament. The breeze, the bees, the seas, the rooks and the brooks, the rails, the gales, the fountains of the mountains all cry. You love the maiden. Take her, we command you. Tis written in heaven for the bright barbed dart that leaps forth into glorious light from each grim thundercloud. <laughs> the very rain pours forth. Sudden sympathy with nature's chorus gives me take my love to reply. No, for a certain chancellor forbids it. Sir, you are England's Lord High Chancellor. But are you Chancellor of trees and birds, King of winds and Prince of thunderclouds? No, but my difficulty is that at present time, there's no evidence before the court that, well, chorus nature has interested herself in the matter. No evidence? You have my word for it. I tell you she bade me take my love. But my good sir, you mustn't say what she told you. It's not evidence. Now, an affidavit from a thunderstorm. Or a few words on oath from a heavy shower. <laughs> <sighs> Would meet with all the attention <laughs> that they deserve. But have you the heart to apply the prosaic rules of evidence to a case that bubbles over with poetical emotion? Distinctly. I have always kept my duty strictly before my eyes. And it is to that fact that I owe my advancement to my present distinguished position. <laughs> when I went to the bar as a very young man, said I to myself, said I, I'll work on a new and original plan, said I to myself, said I, I'll never assume that a rogue or a thief is a gentleman worthy implicit belief because his attorney has sent me a brief, said I to myself, said I. <laughs> Ere I go into court, I will read my brief rules, said I to myself, said I. And I'll never take work I'm unable to do, said I to myself, said I. My learned profession I'll never disgrace by taking a fee with a grin on my face when I haven't been there to attend to the case, said I to myself, said I. I'll never throw dust in a jury man's eye, said I to myself, said I. Or hoodwink a judge who is not overwise, said I to myself, said I. Or assume that the witness has summed in force, and exchequer queen's bench come and please a divorce. Have perjured themselves as a matter of course, said I to myself, said I. In other professions in which men engage, said I to myself, said I. The army, the navy, <laughs> the church, <laughs> and the stage. <laughs> said I to myself, said I. Professional license, if carried too far, your chance of promotion will certainly mark. And I fancy the rule might apply to the bar, said I to myself, said I. <laughs> to be taken from you just as I was on the point of making you my own. Oh, it's too much. It's too much. <laughs> my son, in tears and on his wedding day. My wedding day? Oh, mother, wait with me. <laughs> the laws that are posed between us and the Lord Chancellor is simply different. <laughs> the Lord Chancellor? Oh, if he did but know. 
If he did, but know what? Oh, no matter. The Lord Chancellor has no power over you. Remember, you are a fairy. You can defy him. Down to the waist. <laughs> yes, but from the waist downward, he can commit me to prison for years. Of what avail is it for my body to be free if my legs are left working out seven years penal servitude? True. But take heart. Our queen has promised you her special protection. I will go to her and lay a peculiar case before her. Oh, my beloved mother, how can I repay the debt I owe you? <laughs> When darkly looms the day, and all is dull and gray, to chase the gloom away on thee I'll call. What was that? I think I heard him say that on a rainy day, to while the time away on her he'd call. <laughs> Ah! <laughs> 
had that refreshment been denied? Indeed, our strength and fight have died. Had that refreshment been denied? Indeed, our strength and fight Strephon didn't die. Last very true, let's pipe our eye. Because our Strephon didn't die. Go, traitorous one, forever we must part.
be talking to another. Oh, my, a serpent is a rogue. I tell her very plainly that the lady is my mother. Terradiddle, terradiddle, told all day. She won't believe my statement, and declares he must be party. Because of a career of double dealing, I have started. And get her hand to one of these that leave me broken hearted. Terradiddle, terradiddle, told all day. I didn't see her face, but if they fondled one another, and she's but seventeen, I don't believe it was his mother. Terradiddle, terradiddle, tall lolly. I have often had a use for a thoroughbred excuse of a son, which is English for repente. But of all I ever heard, this is much the most absurd. For she's seventeen and he is five and twenty. For she's seventeen and he is four, five and twenty. Her age upon the date of his birth was minus eight. If she's seventeen and he is five and twenty, she is seventeen and he is four and five and twenty. Say she is his mother, it's an utter bit of folly. Oh, why, I'm sure he's not a rogue. Perhaps his brain is addled and his very melancholy. Terradiddle, terradiddle, tongue all day. I wouldn't say a word that could be reckoned as injurious, but to find a mother younger than her son is very curious. And that's a kind of mother that is usually spared us. Madam, I should say, Madam, you display, Madam, shocking taste. It is rude, Madam, to intrude, Madam, with your brood, Madam, brazen face. You come here, Madam, interfere, Madam, with a pair, Madam, I am one. You're aware, Madam, what you dare, Madam, so take care, Madam, and be tall. Let them stay, Madam, I should say, Madam, they display, Madam, shocking taste. It is rude, Madam, to allude, Madam, to your brood, Madam, brazen face. We don't think It seems that she's a fairy from Anderson's library. And I took her for the proprietor of a lady's 
seminary. Dreams <laughs> of her for the proprietor of a ladies seminary. When next your houses do assemble, you may tremble. <laughs> Say 
Our Lord, we shall you shall not quench with base tonight. When it's fresh, distinction as before, a herd of vulgar flesh. Oh, that's a word. Words filled with joy and madness, dark the hoi polloi. One great remark. One bad word, one great remark, and one that's French. Lord, we shall you shall not quench with base tonight. That word is French. Distinction as before, a herd of vulgar flesh. Oh, that's a word.
Jesus is unqualified to send. Somehow nobody now refuses. Wings and Tories dim their glories, giving an ear to all his stories. Carrying every Billy may wish. Here's a pretty kettle of fish. Kettle of fish. Kettle of fish. Here's a pretty kettle, a kettle of fish. Strappin's a member of Parliament. Carries every Billy. Annoyed? I should think so. Why, this ridiculous protege of yours is playing the deuce with everything. Tonight is the second reading of his bill to throw the peerage open a competitive examination. And he'll carry it, too. Carry it? Of course he will. He's a parliamentary Pelosi. <laughs> he carries everything. Yes, if you please. That's our fault. The deuce it is. Yes, we influence the members and compel them to vote just as he wishes them to. It's our system. It shortens the debates. Well, <laughs> well but think of what it all means. I don't so much mind for myself, <clears throat> but a house of peers with no grandfathers worth mentioning, the country must go to the dogs. I suppose it must. Now, I don't want to say a word against brains. I have a great deal of respect for brains. Often wish I had some myself. <laughs> but with a house of peers composed exclusively of people of intellect, what's to become of the House of Commons? I never thought of that. This comes of women interfering in politics. <laughs> It just so happens that if there is an institution in Great Britain not susceptible of improvement of any kind, it is the House of Peers.
airy condescension. Give me a British representative here. <laughs> then pray stop this protege of yours before it's too late. Oh, but we can't stop him now. Aren't they lovely? <laughs> <laughs> oh, why did you go and defy us, you great geese? Company, First Grenadier Guards. You are a very fine fellow. I am generally admired. <laughs> I can quite understand it. Now, here is a man whose physical attributes are simply godlike. <laughs> he has the most extraordinary effect upon me. If I were to yield to my natural impulse, I should fall down and worship that man. <laughs> I mortify this inclination, I wrestle with it, and it lies beneath my feet. And that is how I treat my regard for that man. Disobey our fairy laws because I fly in realms above in a tendency to fall in love. 
subject would be hardly delicate just to toss up. <laughs> On the whole, we would rather leave it to you. How could it possibly concern me? <laughs> you are both earls, you are both rich, and you are both plain. <laughs> Well, maybe so. At least I am. <laughs> so am I. No, no. Oh, yes, I am indeed very plain. Well, maybe you are. <laughs> There's really nothing to choose between you. If one of you were to forego his title and distribute his estates among his Irish tenantry, why then I should see reason for accepting the other. <laughs> Talala, are you prepared to make this sacrifice? No. Not even to oblige a lady? No, not even to oblige a lady. Then the only question is, which of us shall give way to the other? Uh, 
Maybe on the whole she'd be happier with me. I don't know, I might be wrong. <laughs> no, I don't believe that you are. I believe she would be happier with you. But the thing is, if you are to rob me of the girl of my heart, then we must fight, and one of us must die. <laughs> it's a family tradition that I'm respected to. Very painful position. <laughs> I'm very fond of you, George. My dear Thomas. Oh, it's true. I'm very fond of you. We were boys together. <laughs> or at least, I was. <laughs> if I were to survive you, my existence would be hopelessly embittered. <laughs> then you must not do it. I say it again and again. If it will have this effect on you, you must not do it. No, if one of us is to destroy the other, let it be me. Oh, no, no. Why, yes, by our boyish friendship, I implore you. Well, well, be it so. But no, no. I cannot consent to an act which would crush you with such unavailing remorse. But it would not do so. Oh, I should be very sad at first. Who would not be? But it would wear off. <laughs> George, you're a noble fellow. But that telltale tear betrays you. Truth is, you are very fond of me. And I cannot consent to give you a week's uneasiness on my account. But it would not last a week. Remember, Thomas, you leave the House of Lords. Upon your demise, I shall take your place. It would not last a day. <laughs> now, I do hope you're not going to fight about me, because it really isn't worthwhile. No, I, I don't believe it is. Nor I. The sacred ties of friendship are paramount. Though perhaps I may incur your blame, the things are few I would not do in friendship's name. And I may say I think the same, not even love should rank above true friendship's name. Then free me, pray me, find the blame, forget your grace and go your ways in friendship's name.
awake, so just my headache, it repulses taboo by anxiety. I can see from use any language you choose to indulge in without impropriety. For your head is on fire, the back can spider, a visual slumber to plunder you. Put your couch pangles and then calves your toes and your shoes and you rally from under you. The blinking thing tickles you feel like my spickles are terribly sharp as a pricking. And you're hot and you're crossing your tumble and tossed as nothing keeps new in the ticking. Then the beckles are creep to the ground in a heap and you throw them all up in a tangle. Next to pillow resigned and politely declines to remain at its usual angle. Well, you get some repose in the form of a dose of hot eyeballs and head ever aching. But your slumbering teens were such horrible dreams that you'd very much better be waking. For you dream you are crossing the channel and tossing about a new streamer from Harwich, which is something between a large bathing machine and a very small second class carriage. And you're serving a treat, petty ice and cold meat, to a party of friends and relations. They're a in this hold and they all came aboard to some square in South Kensington stations. And about on that journey, you find your attorney who started that morning from Devon. He's a bit in her sight, so you don't feel surprised when he tells you he's only 11. Well, you're driving like mad with a singular lab by the bag, which is now a four wheeler. And you're playing our names, and he calls you bad names, and you tell him that ties play the dealer. Well, this you can't stand, so you throw up your hand, and you find you're as cold as an icicle. With your shirt and your sock, the back, so Google clock, scratch and Salisbury playing on a bicycle. And he and the crew are on bicycle suits, they've somehow or other invested in. And he's selling the cars of the parts to be large of a company he's interested in. It's a scheme of devices to get a low price, it's all goods and pop mixtures to cables. Which tickled the sailors by treating retailers as though they were all vegetables. You get a good space man to plant a small trays on to take off its boots with a boot tree. Then his legs will take root and his fingers will shoot and they'll blossom and bud like a fruit tree. From the green goes your tree, you get grapes and green pea, cauliflower, pineapple, and cranberry. While the pastry cook pine cherry, brand new will grind apple puzzle and three quarters and banberries. Well, the shares are a penny and ever so many are taken by Rothschild and Barry. And such as a few are lodged to you, you wake with a shot of despairing. You're a regular wreck with a crick in your neck and no wonder you score for your head's on the floor and you need a pen from your soul so you enjoy it your head to keep your legs like to sleep and you cup and you jolt and fly in your nose popping your lung in a feverish tongue and a thirst intense in a general sense that you haven't been sleeping in clover. But the darkness is past and it's daylight at last and the night has been long diddle diddle my song and thank goodness they're both of them Distressed to see his lordship in this position. <laughs> Your lordships. It is seldom that a lord chancellor has reason to envy the position of another. But I am free to confess that I'd rather be two earls engaged to Phyllis than any other half dozen noblemen upon the face of the globe. Oh, yes, it's an enviable position when you're the only one. Oh yes, no doubt, most enviable. But at the same time, seeing you as such, we must say to ourselves, oh, this is very sad. His lordship is as constitutionally as blithe as a bird. He trills upon the bench like a thing of song and gladness. His series of judgments in F-sharp given on Dante in 6-8 time are among the most remarkable effects of chancery. <laughs> He is, I believe, the only living instance of a judge whose decrees have received the honor of a double encore. Bravo! Encore! Encore! Bravo! Sorry. <laughs> How are we to take upon ourselves that which will deprive the court of chancery of one of its most attractive features? I feel the force of your remark. But I am here in two capacities, and they clash, my lords, they clash. I deeply grieve to say that in declining to entertain my previous application to myself, I presumed to dress myself in terms which rendered impossible for me ever to apply to myself again. It was a most painful scene, my lords, most painful. This is what it is to have two capacities. Let us be thankful we have none whatsoever. <laughs> come, come. Remember, you are a kindly old gentleman, and you need have no hesitation in approaching yourself, so that you do so with respect and the proper show of deference. 
Do you really think so? I do. Well, I will nerve myself to another effort. And if that fails, I resign myself to my fate. If you go in, you're sure to win. Yours will be the charm and maybe be your love. The ancient song of fate a never one fell Never, never, never faint or never one fell Every journey has an end when at the worst affairs will mend. Dark the dawn when day is nigh. Hustle your horse and don't say die. With your hay, where a will is, there's a way. Bear the lion in his lair, none but the brave deserve the fair. I'll take heart and make a start. Oh, I fear the prospect's shady. Much I'd spend to gain my end. Fate ought never one fair lady. Never, never, never fate ought never one fair lady. Nothing venture, nothing win. Blood is thick, but water's thin. In for a penny, in for a pound. It's love that makes the world go round. Nothing can should nothing win. God is in for all to sin. In for a penny, in for a pound. It's love that makes the world go round. <laughs> to enjoy oneself in Parliament, when one leads both parties, as I do. Oh, but I'm a miserable, broken-hearted fool. That I am. Oh, Phyllis. Phyllis. Yes? Phyllis! <laughs> or should I say, my lady, as I have yet to be informed which title your ladyship has pleased to select. I... I... I haven't quite decided yet. You see, I have no mother to advise me. No, I have. Yes, a young mother. Not very, a couple of centuries or so. <laughs> oh, she wears well. <laughs> she does. She's a fairy. A, a fairy? Oh. There's no longer any reason to conceal the fact. She's a fairy. Then I, I suppose you're a fairy? Half a fairy. <laughs> Which half? <laughs> the upper half, down to the waist. Dear me. <laughs> There's nothing to show it. Don't do that. <laughs> but why did you tell me this? I thought you would take a dislike to me. But as it's all off, you may as well know the truth. I'm only half a mortal. Oh, but I'd rather have half a mortal I do love than, than half a dozen I don't. I think not. Go to your half dozen. <laughs> it's only two. And I hate them. <laughs> Please forgive me. I don't think I ought to. Besides, a great many difficulties will arise. For you see, 
My grandmother looks just as young as my mother. So do all my aunts. Hmm. I quite understand. Whenever I see you kissing a very young lady, I shall know it's an elderly relative. <laughs> <laughs> You will? <laughs> then, Phyllis, we will be very happy together. We won't wait long. No, of course not. We might change our minds. We'll marry first. Then change our minds afterwards? That's the usual course. <laughs> If we're weak enough to tarry, ere we marry you and I, of the feelings I am spurred, you may tire by and by. For our peers with flowing coffers press their offers, that is why I am sure we should not tarry, ere we marry you and I. If we're weak enough to tarry, ere we marry you and I, with the most attractive maiden you will lead and you will fly. If by chance we should be parted, broken hearted, I should die. So I think we will not tarry. And I may consider myself engaged to Phyllis. <laughs> At first, I wouldn't hear of it. It was out of the question. But I took heart. I pointed out to myself that I was no stranger with myself. That, in point of fact, I had been personally acquainted with myself for some years. <laughs> this had its effect. I admitted that I watched my professional advancement with considerable interest. And I handsomely added that I yielded to no one in admiration for my private and professional virtues. <laughs> this was a great point gain. I then endeavored to work upon my feelings. Conceive my joy when I distinctly perceived a tear glistening in my own eye. <laughs> Eventually, after a severe struggle with myself, I reluctantly, most reluctantly, consented. My lord, a suppliant at your feet, I kneel.
may not be, for so the fates decide. Learn thou that Phyllis is my promised bride. It shall be so, those who would separate us both be tied. My doom, thy lips have spoken, I plead in vain. Forever, thou already broken, Make a suggestion? The subtleties of the legal mind are equal to the emergency. The thing is really quite simple, and the insertion of a single word will do it. Let it stand that every fairy shall die who doesn't marry a mortal. Here he is! And there you are, out of your difficulty at once. We like your humor. Very well. Private Willis! <laughs> to save my life, it seems I must marry at once. How would you like to be a fairy guardsman? Well, ma'am, 
I don't think much of the British soldier who wouldn't ill convenience himself to save a female in distress. <laughs> you are a very brave fellow. You are a fairy from this moment on. <laughs> About you, my lords, would you like to join our ranks? Well, Talaller, now that the peers are to be composed exclusively of people of intelligence, I don't see what use we are down here, do you? <laughs> what use are we? Why, none whatever! Good! Susceptible chancellor, up in the air, sky high, 